Susan Spann, welcome back to the Rocky Mountain Writer Podcast. Hey, Mark, it's great to see you. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be back. And happy Friday morning to you there in Japan. Uh, yes. It's so, so cool to be doing an international conversation. Yeah, the future is great, just so you know. <laughs> Excellent. How's fr Friday looks okay then? Friday looks fabulous. Bright sunshine <laughs> and the birds are singing and we might even hear some crows outside the window if, uh, if they get feisty. <laughs> well, where I'm in Mancus, Colorado, in Southwest Colorado, it was like 30 at best today. I know for a fact in Denver, I think the, they started out in the zeros or twos or threes, something like that this morning. What's it like in Japan right now? Um, well, we work on Celsius, as you may know. Yeah, so uh, yeah. it's, been, it's been hovering around last week. It was, uh, I'm going to do the translation in my head, you know, it was, it was right around two or three degrees. So it was about, you know, the 40s ish yeah yeah uh and colder at night we were into the freezing temperatures we did have a little snow in tokyo we don't get much snow in tokyo we got snow two days this year which was great it accumulated and then melted by the next morning so i think that's what people in colorado would call not snow but that's okay yeah, yeah. uh now we're up into the low 50s at maximum and in the 40s so it's, it's actually for me that's really comfortable it's great climbing weather it's beautiful we won't get a lot of rainfall between now mm -hmm. and the rainy season, which starts in like May. Um, and we've already had the, the ume or the plum blossoms. And we are getting ready for the sakura, the cherry blossoms, which should open in the next, I don't know, two to three weeks. Yeah, awesome. And tell us, remind me anyway, how long now you've been in Japan and also locate us, um, you know, more, a little bit more precisely where you are. What, what's your specific location? Sure. Um, I have been in Japan since May of 2018. So I basically I finished chemo for my cancer on April 10th. And then on May 15th, I believe, or 14th, I uh, moved over here. And I, because of events in the world, I have not set foot yeah. off of Japanese soil since that time. So I've been here wow. consistently since May of 2018. And I love it. I don't have any plans to come back. You know, they're going to have to kind of force me off the island to get me out at this <laughs> point. Um, yeah. And I am physically located in, in Tokyo. But as you say, Tokyo is one of the world's largest cities. So I mm -hmm. actually, and Tokyo, a lot of people don't realize Tokyo is actually a prefecture. It is a special prefecture of Japan. And so I live in South Tokyo, basically Southeast Tokyo in a, one of the 23 special wards, which are actually cities, Tokyo's a megalopolis. And so technically it has 23 cities within Tokyo. And so I live in Meguro, which is one of the 23 cities. And then within Meguro, I live in a little neighborhood called Humonia. And so it's, you know, it's once it's interesting to address a package here because it's like you have your block and your building number and your apartment number and then Meguroku, Himonia, Tokyo, Japan. And so it just kind of goes on and on. And on. Uh, but, wow. Wow. And by now you are, I assume, you know, you're out and about speaking J Japanese. Right? Yes. I mean, I would yeah. not say I was fluent, but I'm definitely, you know, conversational, functional in terms of life. Um, I live, you know, I live my life now in Japanese when I'm it's kind of a weird duality because I live my life in Japanese when I'm out at the market or traveling or doing things like that. But when I'm doing the work that I do, because I also work um, as an editor, you can't just stay in Japan because you'd like to. I mean, that's, that's awesome. I, I wish I could, but like all countries, you know, you have to be contributing and, you know, somehow being a novelist is not considered yeah. as much of a contribution <laughs> as perhaps, you know, one, one might like. So, um, I mean, they do, they actually really value novelists here, but you have to have a Japanese sponsored job in order to stay long-term with some exceptions. And so I work as an editor for a company in Tokyo, an English language editor. So I edit in the evenings so I can write in the mornings and I'm, I'm not at work right now. I'm, I'm here hanging out with you, but then yeah. at, 3 p.m. from, you know, from 3 to 11 on weeknights, I edit. And right now it's still mostly work from home, but uh, I do have an office in Tokyo that I go into. And so it's kind of constant working with words. And it's interesting though, because this, my work there is in English for a native Japanese staff, most of whom speak English to varying degrees. 
Um, you know, there have been some popular websites uh, for years that have sort of like Asian English when yeah. you know, people try to get it and they don't quite get it. And um, it is true that there are some reversals of letters and things that happen that can be mm. fun and engaging, but yeah. it's amazing to me how well people here do speak English, at least the professionals do too. So they must really appreciate seeing you and thinking you're going to be speaking English and then you are comfortable chatting with them in Japanese. That's awesome. I, well, the terror in the eyes of clerks when I walk into a store sometimes is, is, is hard to describe. They, they get this look on their face like, oh my gosh. I can't. <laughs> it's not that they're worried. It's that Japanese people are so focused on being you know, respectful and kind. And when someone comes in, you want to be able to help them and they get really frightened that they're not gonna be able to help me. And yes, you can visibly see them relax and even more so behind the masks because all you can see is this, you know, right. and, and you can kind of see the terror and then you can see them smile and it's great. Yeah, that's great. Very cool. Well, I uh, will get to book eight in your series, which just came out a few weeks ago. It did. And, but I wanna start by asking you about going back to book one and Claws of the Cat, can you yes. imagine, can you take yourself back <laughs> to releasing Claws of the Cat and telling yourself that when book eight came out, you would be close to having lived four years in Japan? At, at, no. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I remember like it was yesterday being at the Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers Conference, which of course is where I met my agent. And screwing up my courage to walk up to her table after, you know, because I couldn't get a pitch appointment. And so I was waiting, 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 you know, for, for a time, not stalking her, no bathroom no, following, no. none of that, but, <laughs> but waiting for the right moment when I might be able to approach her. And after the speaker on Saturday night, which I mean, as everybody knows, that's pretty much your last opportunity, turning around and seeing her at the table and thinking, now's my chance. And I walked up and pitched her. And if you had told me then, and that was... I think that was the 2011 conference. Okay, so, sounds right. So 11 years ago, if you had told me 11 years ago that I was going to have been living in Japan for four years, be four years cancer free, right? You know, uh, you know, have 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 nine books out because it's my eighth Shinobi mystery, but right. my ninth published book, right? I, I'd have asked you what you were smoking and, and yeah. asked if you were willing to share it. Yeah, yeah. And 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 not only that, it'd be one thing if the books were generic, something or other, Colorado or <laughs> something, but you, you wound up in the country, which obviously held deep fascination for you and gives you such a perfect place to research back to the, is it 16th century, something mm -hmm. like that? Yep, yeah. yep. So, I mean, it's just one of those wow stories to me where you just can't, you can't write it any better. You're, you're a story by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's, it's been, it's still one of those things where I wake up in the morning and start sometimes and pinch myself. I mean, I, I just, I look around and think, you know, I don't know what I did to deserve this. I know I don't deserve it, but I'm just so grateful to have it. I mean, it's it's a friend and I were talking the other day and I said, it's like being on vacation every day of your life. I mean, it's the old saw, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And I always thought, you know, yeah, that's great. I really want to do that. And curiously, it, it hasn't worked out. It hasn't worked out the way I planned it to work out at all. Um, in fact, very little of it has worked out the way I planned it. Right. And yet it's so much better than anything I could have planned. And we know if um, I would say the re regular listeners, listeners to the podcast who've been around a while know you are a planner. In fact, I recall pretty clearly from some talks that <laughs> you have this series out to, I think it was 20 plus books. You had it pretty well outlined. 26, yeah. 26, okay. So here we are at book eight. Um, let's dive in on the book. Um, and set listeners up, if you don't mind, for the new one, Fires of Edo or Edo? Yes, Fires of Edo. Fires, Fires of Edo. Of there, is, okay. there is an old joke. Um, it, Tokyo was originally known as Edo. Oh. And there's an old joke about a, uh, a, a English class for Japanese students. And the teacher says, you know, write down where you live in the present tense. And the student says, I live in Tokyo. And then the student says, and the teacher says, now tell us where you live in the past tense. And the student says, I live in Edo. 
<laughs> because Tokyo was known as Edo until the 1600s uh, or no, the 1800s. So it was, you know, oh, yes. Interesting. Okay. Very good. Well, um, that already tells me where the book takes place then. Yeah. That's cool. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It takes place. Actually, ironically, it takes place within walking distance of where I live now, which no. is really kind of fun. Wow. Talk about irony. Yeah. And it involves a bookshop of all things. It does. <laughs> it does. Yeah. The book industry was already quite established in Japan by the 16th century. And most of the books in the 16th century were still produced in Kyoto, which was still the capital of Japan at the time. Edo was just a little tiny town, a little fishing town. They mm. were starting to get some development though. And the culture was so strong of reading and books that there were booksellers here at that point in time. It was a little castle town. And in fact, I make kind of a joke. I can't play a kind of kind of meta tongue in cheek joke in the book at one point. You know, I have my characters, the ninja detective Hiro and Father Mateo, and they're sitting at a table. And, you know, Hiro basically says, you know, I know everybody says this town, you know, the head of my clan says this town's going somewhere, but I just don't see it. And so it's kind of fun to kind of poke, poke a little fun at what yeah. happens historically. Right, right, right. So what happened? What is the basic premise of the plot here? I, I did enough uh, poking around online to know we're getting into some pretty fun detail around firefighting, which sounds absolutely fascinating to me. Yes, this book actually curiously is sort of my an homage to things I into to books which I love, and also to the great long history of firefighting in Japan. Because, you know, when you build with wood and paper, which they do here because of earthquakes and you, you know, it, it burns. And on top of that, all of the materials used to make books burn and some of them explode. And so that was kind of fun to me. And I thought, well, hey, you know, what kind of, what kind of damage can I do here? So basically Hiro and Father Mateo have arrived in Edo. They are trying to warn members of Hiro's ninja clan that a rival Samurai has got a list of the agents and is systematically killing them off. And so they're just trying to warn them. And they get to Edo just as a fire, another fire breaks out. The fire brigade goes running through the street. Father Mateo goes, I want to go help. And there, of course, is the start of a thousand tales. But in this case, a samurai's corpse is found in the ruins of a burned out bookshop. And the bookseller is accused not only of starting a fire, but of having murdered a samurai. And those, both of those actually curiously are capital crimes in Edo at this time. Mm. Allowing a fire to start, even through negligence was a capital crime. And so this man is basically accused of two capital crimes. And of course, Father Mateo is as always unable to let that stand because the man claims that he's innocent. And so they have to unravel the mystery of whether or not someone in the booksellers guild is actually also an arsonist and a murderer. Very good. So for those, again, for those who don't know, uh, set up your two main characters uh, one more time for us too. Sure. Uh, my main characters are uh, Hattori Hiro or Hiro Hattori, depending on whether you use the Western or the English name. And he is a shinobi or a ninja and a member of the uh, Iga Ryu or the Iga clan. And he is paired up with Father Mateo Avila de Santos, who is a Portuguese Jesuit in Japan, uh, ostensibly to spread the good word. But in fact, he just finds himself really fascinated with Japanese culture, like a lot of the Jesuits. The Jesuits were instructed to differ from the culture only on critical points of doctrine. And so Father Mateo really takes that to heart. He loves the Japanese people and he really has strong ideas about right and wrong and justice. And so Kiro is theoretically supposed to be Father Mateo's bodyguard. His clan's been hired to protect Father Mateo by a mysterious benefactor who we as yet have not named in the series. But will and be named probably so, sometime. <laughs> yes, and so I've told people that's that's the last book, friends. So wow. keep reading. Wow. And so Hiro and Father Mateo end up, you know, where Father Mateo goes, Hiro has to go. And Father Mateo gets himself into all kinds of hot water and heroes along for the ride. That's great. So there you are in Japan. The, the, the scene of the latest book takes place within walking distance of where you are right now. And again, I want to go back to Claws of the Cat. And if you would just talk about, you know, a little compare and contrast between online research and what you can manage through kind of remote control research of reading and poking around online versus being immersed 
even though it's five centuries later, um, in, you know, just being in the area and picking up the kind of detail that I assume you have vacuumed up voraciously um, in the last four years, it, it probably has made a tremendous difference in the, in the depth and the richness of what you what you can write. I, I think so. I mean, I, a lot of people know, I actually wrote Claws of the Cat without ever setting foot in country while I was writing it. It was entirely done remotely. And so it is absolutely possible to write very detailed, accurate, historical fiction, especially. I mean, I think it's I think it's a lot harder if you're writing something set in the modern day. I'm actually also right. currently working on a modern thriller set in Tokyo mm. and with a female protagonist. I tell people it's like um, Tomb Raider meets Indiana Jones in modern Tokyo. Okay, I'm in. And so, you know, for something like that, it becomes very difficult to write it remotely because you can use Google Maps, but the reality is that there's nothing that replaces walking the street. There's nothing that replaces standing in the, in the building and, uh, you know, and, and, and really seeing it, especially in a country like Japan where there are a lot of things that are left from the 16th century. So I can go and stand in a house that was built then and I can look around and I can see what it is and I can really feel it. However, Claws, I did write without ever having been here. I, I did cheat on that a little bit. I had a, I worked with a tour guide uh, in Kyoto, which is where that book is set. And the book is set in the uh, Geisha district in Kyoto. And so I asked the tour guide to go to those places and take me pictures and to go into, she sent me some maps for a temple that I needed. And she sent me photographs of the buildings on the inside. So I really was still working from things I had seen. It's just that I had to work harder to do it remotely. You know, you right. have to really be willing to do the footwork. You have to really be willing to maybe try and find someone who can give you that information, who can get the brochures. Online research is real tricky because, you know, you can't just use Wikipedia. <laughs> Right. Anybody can right. edit that. It's not always accurate. In fact, it's often not accurate. Right, right. So, so, so as, as you've been out and about on an average day and, you know, you have a reason to go cross country for a climb, one of your hikes or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have these books planned out, but you must have encountered moments or something or seen something where it's shifted your thinking about what's coming up in the series or uh you know some something has steered you because because you're there you know it actually it has and it has less in terms of the the what i would call the the big setting right mm -hmm. the, the outline of the book is actually really more about where the characters are going physically within their world so i knew that book <clears throat> nine was going to be in, well, technically it was supposed to be book nine in Edo. And what ended up happening is I ended up shifting a piece in another direction. And so what was going to be originally the location of book eight has become the location of book nine and book nine became book eight. So they were supposed to have, have taken a different route to Edo and I brought them up a different way because of something I saw, yes. And also I have, I, but I don't plan out in advance is the particular crime. So I know they're going to be in Edo, but I don't know what they're going to be doing there until specifically until they get there. And then I have to decide on a facet of culture. And curiously, this book was the victim of one of those <laughs> sort of moments of serendipity. I was researching what I thought was going to be book eight on the Nakasendo, which is the old travel road that goes from Kyoto to Edo through the mountains. The Tokaido comes down the ocean route and the Nakasendo goes through the mountains. And I was hiking that route a few years back. And I went to the town of Magome, which is this beautiful little town set on a hill. And it had only one road, the Nakasendo, that went right through it. And the houses are aligned on both sides of the road. And it's been perfectly preserved to its 17th century state. They don't even have power. I mean, they have power, but they buried all the power lines so that everything looks 17th century when you walk in. It's amazing. If you come to Japan and you like historical stuff, you've got to do an overnight in Magome. Anyway, especially in the autumn. So there's a little tiny museum in Magome. And I mean, it's built in the old inn that used to be used by the samurai when they would come through town. There was a special inn for the samurai. And there's this little museum and I walk in this little museum and most of it's got 
just sort of artifacts, you know, a woman's makeup kit from the 17th century and a lunchbox and a candle holder and just things that, things that were part of people's lives. But over in the corner, there's this little wooden artifact and the sign says, this is a fire extinguisher. And the people were so excited when the fire extinguisher was invented. And I thought, wow, you know, it's a little hand pumped wooden box with a hand pump on it, a handle, and you just stick it in the water and you suck up the water. And then, I mean, it looks like a super soaker really is what it looks like. <laughs> a wooden super soaker. And that started me thinking about, you know, wow, fire was such a big deal and firefighting would have been a huge, important yeah. part of these people's lives. And then it started occurring to me, you know, I don't have an arson book in the series yet. <laughs> and from that, I thought, well, I'll see what the firefighting was like in Edo. And sure enough, that's where Fires of Edo came from. So yeah, a little artifact in a little museum that I happened into while doing something entirely different became the basis for this new book. That's fantastic. Wow, I love it. So uh, speaking of your adventures out and about around Japan, um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, just to follow up, because we once had a full podcast, I think, about the book Climb, which yes. uh, recounted, um, told the story of your effort, um, very, very well-planned effort to climb the 100 highest peaks of Japan. Um, and it also got, did not go exactly as planned. Yeah. <laughs> and now you've got that book in your rear view. Reflect on that a little bit for, for me. I know you're still out there hiking and poking around, but um, you know what, what, what were your takeaways from doing that book? And um, how, does it, how, does, how does it feel knowing that it's out there for the world to experience it on the page, even, you know, for others to, to dive in? You know, um, I tell people, people ask me how I feel about climb and my response to it is, you know, the book literally say literally no, no exaggeration saved my life. And so it was the, not only the springboard for all of this, but it literally saved my life. And, and the reason for that is that as, as you say, I had a plan to become the first non-Japanese woman over 40 and, and actually I think the first woman over 40 to climb the Hyakumezan in a year, which that, that didn't, I did climb 100 mountains. They weren't all Hyakumezan. More on that, read the book. But I was getting ready to come to Japan to spend a year climbing those mountains and thought, well, my mammogram, I need to have my mammogram because if I don't have my mammogram, I'll, you know, I'll be in Japan. I'll miss one. I don't want to do that. So I went in to have it early. And that was when they found that I actually had breast cancer and I had triple negative uh, breast cancer. And the oncologist told me if I had delayed my mammogram to its normal time, which was five months later, I would have been stage four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so the book, you know, the fact that I was planning that book literally saved my life. So I can't, I can't uh, thank that book enough. Yeah. The book does talk about the cancer treatment at the beginning and then about my quest to come to Japan and climb 100 mountains in a year, which I did do. And uh, sorry, that's a spoiler, but you probably guessed <laughs> that already. Yeah, and yeah. I am still climbing mountains. I am up to, we, we had this little pandemic that kind of came in and, and got yeah. lodged in the works. I'm only at about 160 right now. Um, but that's still not bad for somebody who never climbed one before she was, what, 48. So wow, it was, it was wow. pretty good. Yeah. How do you How do you work that climbing schedule into your routines now? How do you... Do you head off as often as you can? Is it you wait for good weather? I mean, I know you in climb, you had to climb through right through the winter. Yeah, and, and the winter is actually the least of the problems. I don't like the rainy season. I mean, like the winter is great. You know, you can climb in the snow. That's fine. That's not, you know, that's because yeah. we don't have the same size peaks here in Japan that mm -hmm. you have in uh, Colorado. You know, our highest mountain in the entire country is Fuji, and it's only 3,700 meters and change. So, you know, you're, 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 we're, we're, we're little-ish, but there's still, you know, you're still talking 2,000, 2,000 meter, 3,000 meter. Yeah. Most of the ones I'm climbing are around 1,500 meters, because that's pretty, that's the sort of the easiest to mm -hmm. get to around here, around Tokyo. But no, I, I tend to climb pretty much year round. I do not climb in the rainy season because it can be really dangerous to climb when it gets muddy and rainy. There's a lot of avalanche danger here in some places. So I don't climb in the high mountains, but there are parts of Japan that don't get a lot of snow. So I can climb 
there. I can climb near Tokyo in the winter. I like climbing when there's a little bit of snow or when it is snowing, that's actually really fun. Yeah. Right now I mostly climb on weekends and holidays just because I am working during the week, but I have good vacation. So I take time off too, to go climb. And then once a year, I tend to take a much longer trip. Uh, for example, last September, I went up to Hokkaido. I reunited with my friend uh, Ido who runs Hokkaido Nature Tours, which is a fabulous country, uh, company up there that does custom you can do climbing or hiking or anything nature, they're, they're your guys. But he put together for me a volcanoes and waterfalls nine day um, itinerary. And he and I went out and climbed for nine days and we climbed waterfalls and we climbed mountains and live volcanoes. In fact, I got really, really close to the fumaroles of a live volcano, which was incredible. Mm. And also, you know, just a little bit scary. You look at that, there's a lot of power there. Yeah. So I'm still yeah. climbing regularly, um, <clears throat> one long trip, usually one long trip and about five or six short trips every year. Yeah. Wow. And then I climb on the weekends I can get, I mean, I can get to Fuji on the weekend. It's just that, you know, I've only climbed that one. There's a saying here that every wise man climbs Fuji once and only a fool climbs Fuji twice. <laughs> so I'm not yet a fool. Because, but, because of the traffic or? Because it's, it's big. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Okay. <clears throat> and yeah. Fuji is one of those, anyone who climbs mountains can probably know, and I, I, people who go hiking, some mountains you climb and they're, you know, they kind of go up and down and up and down and there's low flat areas and stuff. And then, you know, stratovolcanoes like Fuji, they, they pretty much go one direction at a time. They go up, no break. they go down. <laughs> yeah. And Fuji, the course weaves just a little bit, but it's still pretty straight nantai that i climbed up in tochigi is literally straight up and straight down and that gets rough on your thighs after a while yeah 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 so is this uh meditating time is it exercise is it both is it uh, yes yeah <laughs> uh yeah no i it's good it's great exercise i find that i go stir crazy if i don't get out i i typically walk I typically walk about close to five miles a day, um, every day. When I'm just going to the office in Tokyo, I get about three miles just going to and from because I live about about a mile and plus from the train station. So I walk that and then I walk in the train stations and, and on the way up and then I will go for a walk at my break and then I'll walk again. So I walk a lot, I get stir crazy. But the mountains are also very meditative. They're a wonderful yeah. place to go and, and sit and walk and i tell people if you you've got a lot of baggage emotionally go spend a year in the mountains because if it's just you in the mountain you will be facing that baggage yeah yeah so i work through a lot of things i feel better than i have in my life actually it's great yeah that's awesome so are you somebody who um you know are taking notes when you're out and about how do you tell, tell us about how your you, your writing schedule and just how you kind of work all that in and and are you somebody who does go around and sort of have little ideas throughout the day that you're going to incorporate in your writing later I mean I do normally my schedule now is that I get up in the morning I do have breakfast do yoga and then I typically write for several hours before I go to before I work I am currently working as I said on a I'm hero and father Mateo on a very short hiatus while I finish this thriller and I am, so I'm working on the thriller. I'm working on a nonfiction book that I hope will release at the end of the year. It's another travelogue. It's called As the Crow Flies. And it's As the Crow Flies, Seven Days on Japan's Kumano Kodo Trail. Ah. It's about hiking the sacred Kumano Kodo in Wakayama Prefecture, which I did in 2020, at the height of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I was out in the woods on the trail. And uh, that was a very interesting experience. Talk about working through some of your, some of your issues. Um, so I'm hoping that that's going to get out this year, hopefully. And I'm still working on editing that. And then on the weekends, I go and travel. And mostly when I'm hiking, and I will both take notes on my computer, and then I will also take pictures. And I will come back. I mean, I have shot over 40,000 images since I came to Japan. So a lot of my notes when I'm writing travelogue or when I'm writing travel fiction or when I'm doing research for one of my novels are actually in visual form because as you know, as a writer, we have to be able to describe things. 
and your memory fades by like 50% within a week or so. And so you think you saw one thing, but maybe you didn't. And so what it was hilarious because I'd come back when I was writing climb, I'd come back from a climb and I'd have pictures of like a bug on a rock because I'd see the bug. Mm -hmm. and, I, and when you're writing a book like climb that takes a year, and I'm also working on another very long-term uh, travelogue. You know, you you don't always know what's going to be significant. So mm -hmm. the answer is take notes about everything, photograph everything, and then when you need it, you have it. So I also do take notes on the phone all the time. If I have an idea, I take a note. When I would do my when I was climbing, when I was writing climb, yeah, I would take pictures and then I'd pull my phone out and I'd either do a, an, an audio note or I would actually just type and I'd take notes on what time it was and what I saw and what I was thinking. And so all of the things, all the details in Climb are real details because I had them recorded in real time. That's great, that's great. One, one thing you get a lot of props for in your series is uh, your description of food and- <laughs> <laughs> I like food. Yeah, and obviously it's gotta be, um, you know, detail specific to the century, or maybe food hasn't changed that much in Japan in the last oh, many hundreds it, of it years. It has, it has, and it hasn't. And mm -hmm. so, food history is really fascinating to me. And, I, and of course, I love food. So, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Is I mean, is that is that something you you enjoy doing? So, it's going to be part of part of the series. It's going to be something that, and your readers are looking for it now. I think. I think they are, and there's a lot of food in Climb as well. I talk a lot about the things that I eat, and I do eat things specifically for the books. One sort of fun little Easter egg about the books, which is is amusing to some people when they learn it, is that uh, I'm allergic to fish. So mm. I I can eat shellfish, some shellfish, not all shellfish, wow. and I but I am in fact allergic to fish oil, which <laughs> creates mm. some issues with vitamins too. But wow. so I'm allergic to fish oil. And so I cannot eat fish and I cannot eat dashi, standard dashi, which is Japanese bonito broth, which is everything mm. here is made, you know, a lot, not everything, right. but a lot of things are. So all of the dishes that are described in my books that are fish based you are written by somebody who, since she was 12 years old, has not actually eaten fish. Wow. Which my son wow. has said to me more than once, how on earth do you do that? Because you're correct. You've got it right. Yeah. How, how, and the answer to that is when you write about food, you're really writing about as much as taste, you're writing about smell and you're writing about texture. And you can get texture by observing somebody else eat something if you cook enough. You know, I can, I can watch the way a fork goes into something and know what that texture is going to be when sure. they put it in their mouth. Yeah. And so that's, Kind of what I work off of, and I, I'm yes, I'm always watching when I'm, you know, looking at things. I don't, I don't stare at other people in restaurants, but I do, you know, I do pay attention. Wow, yeah, I've always thought of Japan as a very seafood-oriented cuisine. It is, and it's not. You know, it it is in the sense that most people eat fish. I would say every day and in some capacity, but there also are whole huge swaths of cuisine here that have nothing to do with fish that have grown up over time. So for example, Shojin Ryori, which is temple cuisine, which is the Buddhist temple cuisine, is actually entirely vegan. Mm. And it's vegan before vegan was cool, so to speak. I mean, it was, it, it's always been made with no animal products at all. Yeah. And so technically that's vegan, sure. but they do it on the basis of a Buddhist belief system. And one of the things that I have always said, I never liked tofu until I started eating it, you know, in Japan and in Thai dishes and things like that. And, and the reason was too many people try to take veganism or vegan dishes. And what they try to do is imitate dishes that are not vegan right. instead of celebrating the vegetables, celebrating right. the tofu for what it is. And I know a lot of people are listening to this right now and thinking, I will celebrate the tofu by throwing it in the garbage where it belongs. But <laughs> the reality is that the tofu is actually I love it. I know not everybody does, and that's totally cool. Everybody should eat what they like, but love it. Love I it. love it. Yep. Yep. That's great. So, yeah. Uh, oh, and also just a little hint up in the Nakasendo area where they had horses that they used as beasts of burden, they also eat something called basashi. Basashi is horse meat sashimi. So, it is, it is sashimi made with raw horse, and I have eaten it. And? 
I, you know, it's really funny is I actually love it. And the cognitive, but the cognitive dissonance that sets up because I'm, I used to ride horses. I have loved horses since I was a little girl. I absolutely adore them. And so the joke I tell people as well, and now I love them two ways. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> Open mind. That's what you are. That's what you have. Yeah. Wow. Um, I have a really dumb question. Are your books uh, translated in Japan, Japanese? It's not a dumb question. And the curious answer is no. And the reason they are not is twofold. The first one is that Japanese people are voracious readers. And until recently, my series wasn't long enough for a Japanese uh -huh. publisher to be interested in it because people here like to read a series. For example, when they're used to reading light novels, Japanese light novels or manga, the new ones come out every four to six months. Yeah. And so they, they are used to reading series very quickly and in order. And so there weren't enough books. Also as a secondary issue, there is an issue of the fact that I'm, until recently, you know, until this last couple of years, I didn't live in Japan. And there is a bit of a prejudice here against Western writers writing about Japanese history. Although, you know, I've, the Japanese people who have read them have all really loved them and said that they yeah. were spot on. So we're hoping to find a Japanese publisher very soon. That's but great. they've been translated into four other languages, so. That's excellent. I've heard that J Japanese, I know you'll know the answer to this, when you translate it, it ends up being a much bigger book because the way the Japanese, you know, type lays out and there's a cost to producing them as well. That's different. Yes. It's a different cost system there or something. I don't know. It is. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and yeah. things do end up getting, you know, getting large because this is not a short language to write in. Yeah. Was Climb translated? We are actually the publishing contract for Climb. Climb is the only book of mine that I did not, was not able to preserve the translation rights. So those are with the publisher. Gotcha. And I don't know if they have got a contract for that yet or not. Yeah, that's great. There has been interest actually over here in getting Climb translated. It's just a matter of whether the publisher has acted on it yet or not. Yeah, very good. Well, um, I have two more quick questions as we wrap up here. One is, um, can you just give us a little bit more about the thriller? Um, is there a working title? Is it um, contemporary? What, what's the... Um, I don't actually have a working title because the working title that I was working with didn't... It's, it's a really hard book to title, which is interesting. It is the first book in a series. It involves a female protagonist who is actually a museum curator who ends up getting sucked into a hunt for an ancient artifact that has been hidden in Japan and now some very bad people are on the hunt for it. They have almost tracked it down and she ends up working with an agent from a Japanese non-government agency that is the Japanese government very often works through these agencies that are not government agencies so that there's this plausible deniability, but they're, so they're not government agencies, but they're not really not, not government agencies. <laughs> and so she, she hooks up with a guy from this agency that specializes in the location and recovery of artifacts that are considered to be too dangerous to be allowed to remain at large. And some of them they go after right away and some of them, like this one, are considered so absolutely dangerous that they're actually safer hidden until such time as they have, they catch wind that somebody else has almost tracked it down. And then they have to get involved in this really fast breakneck race to find it. And she gets wrapped up in all of this accidentally because she ends up in the wrong place at the wrong time, or maybe the right place at the right time, and ends up uncovering a world that is far, far beyond what she expected existed. Wow. So there's little wow. elements of like Warehouse 19 in there and, you know. Yes. Yeah. Is it fun to be writing something other than the, the, the historical series? You know, I love my series. I love Heroes sure. and Mateo. I really enjoy spending time with them. So is it fun to write something else though? Yes, this is, you know, my new protagonist. I, <laughs> I thought her name was going to be something simple, like, you know, Sarah or Becky or some of that. her name is Peregrine. She goes by Perry. She's a little sister named Phoenix. She is an, she is a, I've, somebody asked me, oh, I'm gonna miss Hero. And I said, no, you're really not because if Hero was reincarnated in female form, it would be Peregrine. And so that's, 
She's great fun. So yeah, it's been really, really fun to, to work on. And the book is actually set just as it's contemporary. The book takes place over three days from December 24th to December 27th, 2021. Okay. So it is a absolutely contemporary. In fact, I started writing it before the days actually happened because I knew that I was going to need to get the weather patterns right oh, and do the great. traveling wow. on the day. So wow. I already had most of my first draft finished and then wow. I went and did, and did on the day is what she was doing. So it was kind of fun. Wow. Well, let's come up with a working title right now, Susan, you and me. Come on, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. That's It's a hard great. one. I know it really is. Yeah, this is the yeah. first book I've ever had that didn't have a working title. No, oh, no. Oh. Well, yeah. Good luck so. on that. All right. So the last question, as always, and I did not remind you that this is always the last question. So maybe you have not prepared, but is always to recommend a book or a writer, something you have consumed recently or some longstanding good old book friend that you think more people should be reading or a writer you think more people should be paying atten attention to, anything along those lines? Um, you know, my recommendations on this point. Wow. You know, I read so many things. I think I read five books in the last week, maybe two, maybe, maybe week and a half. I, I typically wow. will go through a book and they're not all long books. You know, I read everything from romance and I don't read romance so much, but I read historical. I read middle grade. I read nonfiction. I read, you know, just about anything. And so an author that nobody is aware of, doesn't have to be. It could be any. It could be just somebody well known. It could be. Okay. Well, too. I'm gonna I'm gonna give a couple of shout outs to a couple of my of my favorite authors. Then um, I'm not gonna pick one because I know you say to pick one, but I'm a rebel. So what can I tell you? <laughs> uh, I just finished Heather Webb's The Next Ooh. Ship Home, which is a fabulous historical set in Ellis Island at uh, the time when Ellis Island was a really big intake for immigrants. It involves an Italian immigrant woman and an American of German descent whose parents are very anti-immigrant, but who ends up working at Ellis Island and helping this Italian immigrant. And it's an absolutely wonderful story. So what, even if historical is not normally your, your thing, it's a great book. It talks about relationships. It talks about our relationship to immigrants and to those who are different from us and how it works with a lot of those really important themes, which are, I think, evergreen. So Heather Webb's Next Ship Home, great book. I'm looking forward to Amy Runyon's The School for German Brides, which is coming out very soon. I've not been able to get my hands on an advanced copy of that, even though, you know, I've been a fan of Amy's since, since forever. Um, I got yeah. actually was privileged to read her first book back when it was still titled Ice Flowers um, before it even had found its agent or publisher. And I have loved her work ever since. I'm a big fan of Corinne O'Flynn's work. And so- um, You're just, just going down, you're just going down your friends list. I can see this. <laughs> <laughs> they are my friends, but you know, what am I supposed to do? I mean, I could recommend Eric Larson, but I think everybody's heard of him. Yeah, yeah. Well, now we know- a lot of People are just really, you know, I, honestly, a lot of, all of those people also, what they have in common is they're all Rocky Mountain fiction writers. I was and, just going to say, and the, and the quality is just so high. I, I happen to know, well, with Amy and Heather, Corinne, all three, the reviews, the, you know, the, you know, just, just overall their presence in the community, their top notch, top drawer books and writers. No question. Yeah, I mean, and that's one of the things that, you know, the real shout out that I'd like to give, I think, is to Rocky Mountain fiction writers. You know, the, the reality is that, I mean, if people are listening to this podcast, presumably they know that RMFW exists, but Rocky Mountain fiction writers is where I got my start. And one thing I would say to people who are listening to the podcast who maybe aren't in Colorado and aren't Think, you know, maybe this isn't for me because I'm not in Colorado. I'm not in the Rocky Mountains. Maybe they're not even in, you know, not even in the United States. Hi. Yeah. Uh, you know, you don't have to be from Colorado or in Colorado to be a part of Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers. And one of the things that has meant the most to me in my writing career has been the way that Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers has really embraced me. And I still feel like part of the group, even though I'm pretty much as far away as you can get yeah, at this point. Definitely. And yet 
you know, I really want to come back for conference. I haven't been able to in the last few years just because I haven't like physically haven't been able to for a while. Right. If I left the country, my visa would have been canceled. And so I couldn't go. But right. Well, but I, I plan to be back the next time we have a conference that is live and when I'm able to leave the borders without yeah. them closing yeah. behind me. Yep. Well, I think you make a great point. Uh, and we do have members all over the country and obviously a few from around the world, but in your case, you built a network here and then you took your network with you and you stayed in touch and you know remained in touch. And, and, and I assume your network is still helping you to this day and you help the network. Yeah, the, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. it's more than just the network, it's a family. You know, yeah. it, is, it, is, it is my herd, as I said many yeah. years ago and will always be my herd. And that is a wonderful thing. And yeah. I hope that my cat is now eating breakfast right okay. next to me. So I don't know. Well, that's our signal. Food, yeah, <laughs> that's all right. No, that's great. Well, Susan, thank you so much um, for jumping on the podcast here. It's so great to catch up and best of luck with all your projects. We can't wait to hear more. And uh, in case you didn't know, now that you know you needed a title for your thriller and you mentioned that Ice Flowers got dumped by Amy, so maybe that's you can pick that up. It's not, it's now available. Oh, well, that's good. I'll, I'll work on that. You know, ice flowers of doom. Yeah. yeah. We'll add of doom. Cause I, Indiana Jones shows you, right. You can just add of doom to anything and then it works. Yeah. All right, Susan, you take care. Thank you. You too. And thanks again for having me on the podcast. It's been great to talk with you. Mm -hmm.